Welcome, dear friend. This is Short Stories, a production of AdventuresInAudio.net. I'm Robert Crandall. I have a couple of announcements to make. Number one, we can now be found on the Electronic Media Collective Podcast Network. You'll find a link on the website. And I'm always looking for new venues to appear on, and we'll announce them when they occur. On the last episode, I mentioned I would have an announcement, but not the one I just mentioned, but another feature that I'm planning, but the vendor is having some issues. So things are being delayed, and I will keep you posted, keep checking the website for uh, this announcement, and... um, Hopefully, it will be soon. Our story for this episode is a story about the Battle of Mons during World War I. The British Army was outflanked by the Germans and in retreat when a miracle occurred. When the story was published in 1915, people thought it to be true and a sign of hope in a dreadful war. Arthur Mackin insisted it was not true, and a controversy ensued. I hope you enjoy The Bowman by Arthur Mackin. It was during the retreat of the 80,000, and the authority of the censorship is sufficient excuse for not being more explicit. But it was on the most awful day of that awful time, on the day when ruin and disaster came so near that their shadow fell over London far away. And without any certain news, the hearts of men failed within them and grew faint, as if the agony of the army in the battlefield had entered into their souls. On this dreadful day, then, when 300,000 men in arms with all their artillery swelled like a flood against the English company, there was one point above all other points in our battle line that was for a time in awful danger, not merely of defeat, but of utter annihilation. With the permission of the censorship and of the military expert, this corner may perhaps be described as a salient. And if this angle were crushed and broken, then the English force as a whole would be shattered. The Allied left would be turned, and Sedan would inevitably follow. All the morning the German guns had thundered and shrieked against this corner, and against the thousand or so of men who held it. The men joked at the shells and found funny names for them, and had bets about them and greeted them with scraps of music hall songs. But the shells came on and burst and tore good Englishmen limb from limb and tore brother from brother. And as the heat of the day increased, so did the fury of that terrific cannonade. There was no help, it seemed. The English artillery was good, but there was not nearly enough of it and it was being steadily battered into scrap iron. There comes a moment in a storm at sea when people say to one another, it is at its worst, it can blow no harder. And then there is a blast ten times more fierce than any before it. So it was in these British trenches. There were no stouter hearts in the whole world than the hearts of these men but even they were appalled as this seven times heated hell of the German cannonade fell upon them and overwhelmed them and destroyed them. At this very moment they saw from their trenches that a tremendous host was moving against their lines. Five hundred of the thousand remained, and as far as they could see the German infantry was pressing on against them. Column upon column, a gray world of men, ten thousand of them, as it appeared afterwards. There was no hope 
at all. They shook hands, some of them. One man improvised a new version of the battle song, Goodbye, Goodbye to Tipperary, ending with, And we shan't get there. And they all went on firing steadily. The officer pointed out that such an opportunity for high-class fancy shooting might never occur again. The Tipperary humorist asked, What price? Sydney Street? And the few machine guns did their best, but everybody knew it was of no use. The dead gray bodies lie in companies and battalions. Others came on and on and on, and they swarmed and stirred and advanced from beyond and beyond. World without end. Amen, said one of the British soldiers with some irrelevance as he took aim and fired, and then he remembered. He says he cannot think why or wherefore. A queer vegetarian restaurant in London, where he had once or twice eaten eccentric dishes of cutlets made of lentils and nuts that pretended to be steak. On all the plates in this restaurant, there was printed a figure of St. George in blue, with the motto, Adsit Anglis Sanctus Georgius. May St. George be a present help to the English. This soldier happened to know Latin and other useless things. And now, as he fired at his man in the gray advancing mass, three hundred yards away, he uttered the pious vegetarian motto. He went on firing to the end, and at last Bill, on his right, had to clout him cheerfully over the head to make him stop, pointing out as he did so that the king's ammunition cost money and was not lightly to be wasted in drilling funny patterns into dead Germans. For as the Latin scholar uttered his invocation, he felt something between a shudder and an electric shock passed through his body. The roar of the battle died down in his ears to a gentle murmur. Instead of it, he says he heard a great voice and a shout, louder than a thunder peal, crying, Array! 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 His heart grew hot as a burning coal. It grew cold as ice within him as it seemed to him that a tumult of voices answered to his summons. He heard, or seemed to hear, thousands shouting, St. George! St. George! Ha! Messiah! Ha! Sweet Saint! Grant us good deliverance! St. George for Merry England! Harrow! Harrow! Monsignor! St. George! Succor us! Ha! St. George, ha! St. George, a long bow and a strong bow. Heaven's night, aid us! And as the soldier heard those voices, he saw before him, beyond the trench, a long line of shapes with a shining about them. They were like men who drew the bow, and with another shout their cloud of arrows flew singing and tingling through the air towards the German host. The other men in the trench were firing all the while. They had no hope, but they aimed just as if they had been shooting at Bisley. Suddenly one of them lifted up his voice in the plainest English. God help us! He bellowed to the man next to him. But we're blooming marvels! Look at those gray gentlemen! Look at them, do you see them? They're not going down in dozens nor in hundreds. It's thousands. It is. Look, look, there's a regiment gone while I'm talking to you. Shut it, the other soldier bellowed, taking aim. What are you gassing about? But he gulped with astonishment, even as he spoke for indeed the gray men were falling by the thousands. The English could hear the guttural scream of the German officers, the crackle of their revolvers as they shot the reluctant, and still line after line crashed to the earth. All the while the Latin-bred soldier heard the cry, 
Harrow, Harrow, Monsignor, dear Saint, quick to our aid. Saint George, help us. High Chevalier, defend us. The singing arrows fled so swift and thick that they darkened the air. The heathen horde melted from before them. More machine guns, Bill yelled to Tom. Don't hear them, Tom yelled back. But thank God, anyway, they've got it in the neck. In fact, there were 10,000 dead German soldiers left before that salient of the English army. And consequently, there was no sedan. In Germany, a country ruled by scientific principles, the great general staff decided that the contemptible English must have employed shells containing an unknown gas of a poisonous nature, as no wounds were discernible on the bodies of the dead German soldiers. But the man who knew what nuts tasted like when they called themselves state knew also that St. George had brought his Agincourt Bowman to help the English. You've been listening to The Bowman by Arthur Mackin. Carl Sandburg once said, Time is the coin of your life. It is the only coin you have, and only you can determine how it will be spent. Be careful lest you let other people spend it for you. I've enjoyed being with you, but now I must go. I hope to be with you again soon. Please take care and thank you for listening to me.